I asked the storytellers uh, to, to answer the question. I actually was, it was in the formative stages when I asked this first uh, storyteller. Uh, I said, what, what is right? I didn't say who is right, I said, what is right? And his answer uh, was, and I quote, if you take uh, away everything that's left, then what's left is right. Please welcome Frank Wilczek. In 15 minutes, Frank Wilczek will be coming to the stage. Uh, but in the meantime, Frank Wilczek, everybody. science fans. In the late spring of 1999, I got a phone call from Scientific American. A man named Walter Wagner, who I later learned was a banana farmer in Hawaii, was worried about black holes. More specifically, he was worried about the accelerator that was going to start operating on Long Island, at Brookhaven Lab, uh, that that accelerator would produce little black holes that would then start swallowing things and would swallow Long Island <laughs> and then swallow the world. <laughs> so they asked me to uh, write a reply to Mr. Wagner. Uh, why me? <laughs> well, the, the point of this accelerator was to study what happens when you collide very, very fast moving energetic atomic nuclei with each other. And uh, the point of the study was mostly, largely, to test my theories about the existence of gluons and the properties of quarks that uh, would tell you, or are supposed to tell you, what happened in these collisions. That uh, in this collision you produce a fireball of gluons and quarks and anti-quarks. You produce uh, something that we think the early universe looked like. So people were making models of what the early universe, the very early universe looked like based on my theories, but the theories had never been tested directly. And this is what was gonna happen at Brookhaven. So I was supposed to be an authority on what was happening in these collisions, and when Scientific American called the Brookhaven press office, the press office referred them to me. If everything went well, and these theories were verified, I would be a hero, probably get a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, so uh, I wanted to be the, no the go-to guy, and so uh, I thought I really had to write this reply, and I said yes. So I started writing this reply, and I explained that gravity between little things like atomic nuclei, is very feeble, so that you really couldn't produce a black hole at Brookhaven. And even if you did, the black hole that you produced would be really, really small. It would be smaller than an atom, even smaller than an atomic nucleus, and really, really small. And it wouldn't be the gaping maw that you see in Disney films. It would be this really tiny thing, very, very feeble gravity comes out of it. It really wouldn't be very good at sucking up matter or Long Island or the world. <laughs> and even if it did... <laughs> When you took into account quantum mechanics, as Stephen Hawking taught us in his greatest work, uh, these black hole, this light, tiny black hole would be unstable, would decay quickly before it could do much eating. 
And even if you didn't believe all of that, there was the fact that every day, somewhere on Earth, several times in fact, in different places on the Earth, uh, collisions between cosmic rays raining down on the Earth and the atmosphere, or Earth itself, with as much energy as was going to be produced in the collisions at the accelerator were happening. And this had been going on for billions of years and the Earth was still here. So, I thought that was a pretty convincing reply altogether. <laughs> but, uh, it was all so obvious and kind of trivial that I was kind of embarrassed to uh, put my name to this. I mean, any fool could have done that analysis and showed that uh, Mr. Wagner had nothing to worry about. But I was supposed to be brilliant and a potential Nobel Prize winner, so I thought I should produce something more compelling and unique and original. So, I decided to spice it up. <laughs> now, now, there is actually a much more plausible way that you could imagine an accelerator destroying the Earth. <laughs> and this is something called strangelets. Some otherwise respectable physicists had speculated about the possibility that you could have an alternative way of quarks arranging themselves to the way they ordinarily do, to the way they do in the matter that we know about and are comfortable with and are made out of, that there would be this alternative form in which they were much more dense. Uh, this is called strange matter because the strange matter would also contain a lot of strange quarks. And little chunks of strange matter are called strangelets. So you can imagine producing strangelets at an accelerator, like the Brookhaven accelerator. And that was much more serious. And I was very proud that I had produced a more interesting <laughs> reply. <clears throat> but, uh, well, I went on to analyze, to discuss uh, in more detail the physics of these strangelets and uh, why really uh, when you thought about it more deeply uh, there was no genuine possibility of producing um, strangelets which would grow at, at uh, Brookhaven. I should say uh, if you want to visualize strangelets think of ICE-9 Kurt Vonnegut's Ice-9, which is a form of water, a different state of water that could crystallize and then swallow the oceans, because the water would like to crystallize around a little bit of Ice-9. Or think of prion diseases in, inside brains, where you have little crystals of, an abnorm of a brain protein, and if you have a little crystal, the rest of the brain protein of that kind will start to crystallize around it and your brain kind of solidifies and you get uh, kuru, you get all silly and uh, die. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, so strange glitch are like that, they're like ice nine for water or like uh, prions for brain proteins, but they would, uh, they would do the job for nuclear matter of all kinds. So, if you produced a strangelet that did that, it would uh, be a bad thing. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so I discussed all that, but then I went on to discuss that you know, there were many barriers to that. It, couldn't, it wouldn't happen at Brookhaven. And I concluded, of course, with the uh, conclusive argument from cosmic rays that if it was going to happen, it would have happened already. So it was all very elegant, and I now was happy, proud to sign my name to this uh, piece. But when I sent it to Scientific American, uh, they were not pleased. Or 
they, because what I had produced was much too long. <laughs> it was uh, more like an article than a reply to the letter. It was much, much longer than the letter itself that started it. So they said, well, you know, we only have limited space for letters. We're going to have to make some cuts. I said, oh, well, uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, well, time passed, and uh, they made some cuts. The cuts were not exactly surgical, unless by surgery you mean amputation of limbs. And when they sent me the stump <laughs> that was left, uh, I was getting ready to pack up and uh, leave for my summer seclusion up in New Hampshire. And uh, I didn't want to get involved in fighting a losing battle. So I just glanced at it and said, uh, sure, OK, go ahead. The hell with you. <laughs> And so uh, I went to New Hampshire and spent several idyllic weeks, lovely weeks, uh, swimming and thinking and writing and reading. Really lovely. Until one day, my brother-in-law shows up uh, riding his motorcycle and uh, seems rather frantic, says, you've got to call Princeton. I got a message from your secretary. You've got to call. It's, an emer it's really important. <laughs> OK, well, what you should know is that um, the reason he had to be delivering this message is that when I said secluded, I mean secluded. We didn't have tele telephone. We didn't, certainly didn't have internet at, at that time. We had nothing. And in fact, the nearest phone was five miles away. It was a pay phone. So to uh, get back to Princeton and respond, I had to drive five miles down to the pay phone, which I did. And when I called up my secretary, Margaret, uh, she was really excited. She was, I, this was the most excited I'd ever heard Margaret before or since. And she said, we've got an emergency. <laughs> a lot of people want to talk to you. <laughs> and she told me what had happened. What had happened was that on July 18th, the Sunday Times of London had a banner headline, all in capitals, that said, the final experiment. <laughs> question mark and underneath it was this really lurid picture of a fireball obviously from a nuclear explosion and the mushroom cloud I mean the worst possible catastrophe you can imagine and the article uh, was quoting me <laughs> quoting very selectively from my article <laughs> from my reply to uh, Mr. Wagner that in such a way as to suggest that I was endorsing the idea that this accelerator really would maybe do the ultimate experiment and destroy Long Island and then the world. <laughs> so uh, there were many journalists then who picked up on this story. They wanted to interview me. And I also had a call from the management of Brookhaven Laboratory. <laughs> and they really wanted to talk to me. <laughs> so, uh, so I called up Brookhaven, had the, or uh, actually, uh, yeah, I called up Brookhaven, and, but they said, uh, the director's busy, uh, we'll call you back. So I gave them the number of this payphone, and he called me back about 10 minutes later, and he said, uh, uh, we have a problem. Uh, we're getting inquiries from our congressman and from Governor, uh, from Senator D'Amato's office. Some of you may remember Senator Alphonse D'Amato. He was very interested in this. <laughs> 
and uh, you've really caused a problem here, Frank. And uh, you're, gonna, you're really going to have to talk to all these journalists. And he gave me a list of 20 journalists that I had to talk to. And you're going to have to uh, reassure people and get this situation under control. Tell them the truth so that, uh, so that the laboratory can go ahead and do the experiments that you want it done. Okay. So uh, he was very nice about it. But clearly the message was that uh, you really fucked up, guy. And uh, now you made a mess and you'd better clean it up. OK, so, uh, so I had this list of 20 uh, journalists that I had to get in contact with. I started to work on it. There were big problems because uh, the only way I could reach them was to do this payphone, and the payphone was shared with uh, some really scary looking truckers. <laughs> Not very patient. So I had to kind of make uh, a schedule. I also had to ask the people to call me because they didn't have enough quarters for all these international calls. And so I spent two weeks, I'm sorry, two days, it seemed like two weeks, two full days plus another half day uh, talking one an hour or so to these journalists, uh, most of whom didn't speak English very well. I used hand gestures, and uh, almost all of whose knowledge of science was extremely tenuous. And uh, because of that, I was able to reassure them and, and uh, take the tempest down. So, uh, but I really suffered for science that time. Just between us, it was kind of fun, especially in retrospect. The next time I suffered for science was uh, October 3rd, 2004, when I got another phone call. What happened was, uh, I knew the Nobel Prize was going to be announced that day, at 6 a.m. Eastern Time. So I wasn't able to sleep. But uh, at 5 a.m., I looked at the clock and said, well, okay, you might as well take a shower just in case you'll be ready. And then at 5.11, my wife came in with the telephone, our mobile phone, and said, uh, there's a lady on the phone from Sweden, says she wants to talk to you. And uh, I didn't know that they told you you win the Nobel Prize before they make the official announcement. And that was it. I also didn't know what the phone conversation would be like. I thought it would be, uh, congratulations, you've won the Nobel Prize goodbye. <laughs> but it wasn't that way at all. And I guess, oh well, I could tell you a lot about it. But to make uh, a long story short, uh, I got all kinds of instructions, uh, starting with shut up until 6 o'clock when the official announcement comes. Uh, congratulations from friends. Uh, can uh, talk to the chairman of this committee and the president of that academy and so on. And it all took 20 minutes or so, uh, probably longer. The whole time I was stark completely naked and dripping wet. <laughs> and so that was the other time I suffered for science. Uh, okay.